back four of our speakers today. We're going to bring back Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, uh, David Swanson, and Daniel McAdams, and Robert Jensen. So if you folks could come on up and uh, maybe Russ, you could put this and wherever they sit, put the right name tag, that would be good. So we've heard a lot today about what's wrong with the current situation and, uh, and some things about the possibilities for a different approach. So I would kind of like the day to, we're going to come back and hit a few other issues like civil liberties, militarized policing, and a specific case in Venezuela of U.S. Inter intervention and, and attempts to undermine. But to look toward what are alternatives? Is there a different policy that uh, would be better for the United States? How should we live in the world? And uh, how can we get people to understand this and to support it and to demand it? We've heard a lot of good, good thoughts today that uh, you would think, you would think would lead people to say, we need to get out of being the policeman of the world, bring those troops home. We're doing more harm than good. And we thought when we started this conference planning, we thought it's time to learn the lessons of the Iraq war. The American people are ready. They can see how horrible it is. And then the situation with ISIS develops last year, and the pictures are on the news, and now send the troops over and take. So the chance to learn the lessons of Iraq seemed to kind of disappear over the last year. So it's tough. It doesn't, it, you know, there's not an easy way out of this. The question I wanted to kind of start you folks with, and you can run with it any way you want to, and we've alluded to this somewhat, but I thought maybe you might have your own views on this. Seeing as how war kills people, our own, including other people around the world, it wastes tremendous amounts of our, of our resources our, our, that could be used for better things, that doesn't help the economy for most people. Why do, why do we continue to follow a militaristic, interventionist policy year after year, and it's even appearing to become worse after the end of the uh, Cold War. We seem now to feel like the whole world is our, is our empire and not an empire of liberty, an empire of, of conquest and domination. What supports this? Who is in charge of U.S. policy? What are the goals of U.S. foreign policy? And what sustains it? And how, or that maybe gives us a chance to figure out what we have to address to get a change from the course that seems to be getting even worse every year. Who would like to jump in on that? And then I'll be taking questions from people out there. If you fill out the form, they'll bring it up to the front. And uh, uh, I might ask Colonel Wilkerson, because one of his uh, interviews that we saw before we uh, pick, picked him as one of our speakers was, who makes U.S. foreign policy? And so maybe you can jump in on that. Having been very close to the center of where decisions are made? Well, a broad, comprehensive answer to the question, I think, uh, not getting, uh, not trying to get too complex about it, is that it's profitable, not as was just pointed out for the American people or for the country America, it's profitable for you. Second, it's in our blood to a certain respect, and third, our leadership and our institutions in which that leadership functions is predisposed to war. Um, that's enough right there to make, make us want to question fundamentally the whole process. Money, institutional predisposition, and uh, an enormous penchant for it. And anyone who thinks we don't have that ladder needs to check how many guns are in this country. I had an FBI agent tell me the other day that the estimate of the Bureau for weapons in this country is over 900 million. I think he's wrong because that's only three per person, and I know people who own 30 or 40 or 50. But that's enough to make you question at least you know, what is the spirit of this country? The spirit of this country is a 357 magnum on the side of an individual in the Williamsburg Library in the children's section. Am I walking up to him 
as a professor from William and Mary happened to be in that library at that moment and asking him, asking him why he felt it was necessary to wear a 357 Magnum pistol in the children's section of the Williamsburg Library. And he looked at me and said it was his right. Enough said. So the question was, who makes foreign policy? Just from my experience of, what, 11 or 12 years on the Hill, from the legislative side, I can say it's incredibly, and, and Colonel Wilkerson pointed this out in the executive branch, but certainly the legislative branch, it's very, very stovepiped. A very, very small group of people in committees handle the foreign policy. Members and member staffs, particularly if they don't play by the rules, are frozen out. I can't tell you how many times, and this is just one example, how many times I'd go to a Republican staff meeting and there'd be a piece of legislation already written, presented to us, preparing us for the markup the next day of the bill, and they would say, well, hold on, we haven't seen this, this particularly dealing in the Middle East. We haven't seen this. We haven't read this legislation. What's it about? Don't worry, APAC wrote it and approved it. Uh, and that happened a number of times. So special interests come in. They write bills. Uh, bills on Ukraine, for example, there's one guy. There's one guy in Washington. I think he works for the Congressional Research Service. Anything dealing with Ukraine, he wrote it. So, and he has a beef. So nobody knows who he is uh, normally. But they, they write these bills. They're delivered. If you're on a committee and you're one member and you see things differently, you're demonized. You're treated badly. Just for an example, someone who's relatively mild these days, uh, by, by all accounts, Dana Rohrbacher from California, he dared to suggest that the war rhetoric with Russia should be slightly toned down uh, a couple of weeks ago in a committee hearing and see the attacks on him, the demonization. So individual members don't have much, much power. They don't have any say in the legislative process unless they're willing to trade things that the leadership wants. But the leadership system and structure in Congress prevents any meaningful debate on foreign policy. If you look at any committee hearing in, a foreign, in the Foreign Affairs Committee, you'll see every single witness has the same perspective. Without, without exception, you won't find a debate happening in the House of Representatives. So that means there is no debate. There's no debate in policy. Well, I, I am inclined to agree with, uh, with the comments thus far. I, I do think there are examples such as uh, 2013, a uh, proposal for so-called missile strikes into Syria where the so-called leadership of the two parties and the president and by all indications on Raytheon stock, Wall Street, uh, and of course all of the television networks were convinced it needed to happen, was about to happen imminently, uh, and it didn't, and that a large part of that um, uh, was that, uh, well, it was Jewish holidays, APEC was not in the picture. Uh, it was uh, Congress on break doing town hall meetings and people coming up and saying, why, why are we getting in a new war on the side of Al-Qaeda? We thought Al-Qaeda was the bad guys. Can you explain this to us? Uh, and a lot of it was Congress members not wanting to be the jerk who votes for another Iraq because voting for Iraq had been turned into such a badge of shame, which is, of course, why Hillary Clinton is not already president. Um, and, uh, and so I think there are instances where you combine those factors with other factors, resistance within the military itself, reluctance in the White House, the, the House of Commons in England going against it and so forth, that uh, something can be, can be done against all odds. Um, but I do think that you're going up against the influence of money, you're going up against the profits, you're going up against the ideology of world domination and war. You're going up against a vicious cycle of a politics that rewards uh, war makers within Washington and, and electorally, uh, and, and a lot of that through a corporate media system that uh, praises war and, as I said, assumes war uh, is inevitable. Um, so the, 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 the playing field is not flat, um, but you can still run up that hill once in a while. I hate to be uh, negative about that. I, I, I take it. It was a great victory when this happened. I was, frankly, quite surprised. Sadly enough, they kind of got their war anyway, though. They just did it by other means. No, there's no question, as I have said repeatedly, instead of taking a different approach and sending in aid and arms embargoes and negotiations and, and peaceful measures, 
uh, the, and the polling among the U.S. public was even more strongly against sending in CIA arms and troops than trainers than, than sending in the missile strikes. But that's what they did. Yeah. And they did that for two years. They exacerbated the problem. They bided their time. They came up with the better propaganda in the form of the beheading videos, as if the United States is not propping up governments that behead people by the hundreds. Uh, and they got the war, albeit on the opposite side from the war that we had a moral obligation to get in on. So make sense of that. But uh, my point is completely shut down the military uh, war machine, only that we obviously could because virtually no effort went into that. Uh, five or six percent of us in this country got seriously active and committed. We'd turn everything around. Yeah, let's move along. I don't have anything to add. We'll go forward. Well, I wanted to ask you, Bob, a question about this. Um, and they've, they've mentioned this already, uh, it, really the role of the media in support for war. And how do you see that? Uh, you, you talked about several different levels where the, the institution, the profession, and to some extent the ideology are filters. Yeah. But how important do you think, say, TV is in supporting the war system that is, continues and seems to be even getting worse? I would say that the issue isn't how does journalism, especially television, support the war. It's how does journalism and the television and all the other media forms support concentrated power, of which war is one subset of questions. Right? And it's quite clear that if you look at all of the research and the experience and the self-reflection of, of journalists who've come out, that the system works roughly the way I described it. Right. That means that it's not that journalists could never critique a particular war. And sometimes when the debate within the political sector expands enough to critique a war, journalists will follow through. Right. So journalists aren't you know, magically committed. They're committed to, they work within a set of institutions. They're committed to a set of professional practices that lead a certain way. But even then, I think what's important, I, I tend not to be, even though I'm a journalist, I teach in a journalism school, I'm, I, I'm wary about being too media-centric because the media don't set policy, they, they reflect what's going on in the world. And I think you see that especially in the way that they follow the flag on war, when even when they dissent, they dissent within the very narrow boundaries of acceptable opinion within the halls of power. The place where this is most misunderstood is the discussion about the Vietnam War. There's this constant reference today, if only the press would behave like they did during Vietnam. There's only one problem with that. It's based on a flawed understanding of the history of the US media in Vietnam. And there's, again, research on this and reflections on this. So up until about 1968, the Tet Offensive, the US news media was wildly supportive of the US war in Vietnam. It, it followed the basic framework. Right? And all of the protests weren't really having much of an effect on media. The, the US media started to, to lend a more critical eye to the Vietnam War when certain segments of concentrated power started to critique the Vietnam War, which is around 1968. Right? So everybody remembers Walter Cronkite's famous you know, on-air uh, rejection of the Vietnam War. Lyndon Johnson is alleged to have said, if we've lost contract, Cronkite, we've lost America. There's another interesting clip of Cronkite. It's in Norman Solomon's film, War Made Easy, where, where Walter Cronkite is taking a ride along uh, on, a, on a US bomber in Vietnam. He gets in, you know, it's a ride along is a journalistic term for going along with somebody in, in an official capacity. Journalists often ride along with the cops, for instance. Right? And so Walter Cronkite, in a segment for CBS News, gets in this bomber. And he's going, boy, this is really cool. Look at, we're going up, we're going down, we're dropping bombs. He gets off and he, he shakes the, the, the pilot's hand, I think it was a colonel, and says, thank you for a job well done or something like that. I mean, this is the way the US news media work. They follow concentrated power when there is dissent within the halls of power. They may reflect it. But even then, the US media was not asking the American public in the Vietnam, at the end and after the Vietnam War to reflect on the profound immorality of the war and the barbarism. It was following that critique that 
we shouldn't have stayed so long, we misunderstood it. Right? But that's a function of the problem of American politics more generally, not just the media. So the media has a role in this, but I, I don't think they really have the central role in that sense. I wanted to throw out uh, another question, then I've got a bunch of good ones to come up. But one issue that hasn't come out a lot today that I thought you might have some insights from different perspectives is how close are we to a nuclear confrontation with Russia? My impression and what some people have said is that we are at about the point we were in 1962 potentially, and in fact what we later learned the position was in 1983 with the deployment of Euro missiles, that the tensions and the militarization and the threats with the same two nuclear powers facing each other are reaching again that critical point, and do, do any of us even think about this? So, and so I, my question is, is this an exaggeration or is it that bad? Well, I'll start. Um, in my studies of post-World War II period, the most serious time was not the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. That was the media in, in large part. Uh, it was the administration. It was the American people. It was the 13 days and so forth. The real serious crisis lasted a much longer time, arguably nine months, and it was over Berlin known by historians as the 1961 Berlin crisis. The reason was because Cuba was never strategic for Nikita Khrushchev. He could back out of Cuba. He was taking a gamble, putting those missiles there at Fidel's request because Fidel was fearful of us invading. Uh, we'd already tried it, the Bay of Pigs, and he was fearful we'd do it again and we'd do it with the American military. And so he asked the Russians in. The Russians said, yeah, fine, because Nikita saw a real rapid way to gain strategic ascendancy or at least balance. Ironic that Kennedy had won the election based on the missile gap. But it wasn't strategic for Russia. So he could leave. And Kennedy and he could work it out. And he did leave. Berlin was very different, very different. Berlin was strategic. Bottom line of that was we helped and how many Americans know this, we essentially helped the Soviet Union build the Berlin Wall. And we did that because that was the only way to stem the flow of East Germans into West Germany and thus destroy the Soviet bulwark in the center of Europe. We had to do that. We were going to go to nuclear war. Well, why would I go back to that? Because the question you just asked is beginning to look like it has proportions that Berlin had, that is to say, serious strategic proportions. A couple of weeks ago, I attended briefings by the Finns, the Swedes, and the Norwegians on the 2012, 2013, and 2014 major army exercises of Russia. The general template that the Swedes put down, they were the most demonstrative in this, and I tend to listen to the Swedes and the Finns because they live closest to and understand Russia, was that the template goes something like this. The Russians are exercising within the treaty organization that they've formed in order to oppose a NATO incursion into their near abroad. And they specify what that near abroad is, and uh, arguably it includes, although it wasn't in the exercise doctrine, it certainly was implied at least a portion of Ukraine, Georgia, Belarusia, and so forth. Their exercises included, and this is doctrinally included in their exercises. You can read their doctrine, the fact that they are, they think themselves inferior conventionally to NATO. Now, whether that's true or not is not relevant, really. If you think you are, you are. That's how you act. And so in order to make up for that, they are using what they call in Russian micro nukes in order to hit the head of the NATO incursion, wherever it might be. 
Further, they're considering that use of small yield nuclear weapons, a half a KT or so forth, as non-escalatory. Again, in their doctrine, in their published doctrine. So they're saying, in essence, that if you do something that looks like you're coming into our near abroad with NATO forces, we are going to hit the head of that penetration with a small yield nuclear weapon, and we do not consider that to be nuclear war we consider it to be non-escalatory. You will not, in other words, respond with a nuclear weapon. That's exceedingly dangerous in my view. As a, as a military officer, as a, as a guy who's planned for this for the last, you know, however much of the Cold War, um, that's, not, that's not what they should be doing. And, and yet it is what they're doing. You can say, well, that's not what the political leadership believes. That's not what Vladimir Putin believes. That's not what the Duma believes. But as your military goes in war planning, as was pointed out, so go you later on. It's almost inevitable that that's what's going to happen if that big a complex in your environment is planning for it. And all the things that go into that planning in addition to it in the Russian military industrial complex. So it's scary. I don't think it's quite as bad as perhaps it was in 61. But because it has become very strategic to Russia, it is bad. Can I add something Please. to this? I, I think a lot of people in America, and, and more so, I mean, the more you consume U.S. media, the less you know about the, the reality. A, a lot of people do not understand that Russia has been repeatedly disastrously, I mean, disasters that that dwarf all U.S. disasters combined, uh, being invaded by Germany in its history. And when the two Germanys reunited, the United States made a promise to Russia that NATO, which at this point didn't have any reason to keep existing but was going to, that NATO would not expand an inch eastward toward Russia. Uh, and of course, NATO did. Over the past decades, NATO has moved right up to the border of Russia and is now engaging in military exercises and demonstrations literally at the border of Russia. Uh, the United States facilitated a military coup in Ukraine, on the, a nation that borders Russia. And, uh, and now we now have National Guard guarding the wrong nation over there, training neo-Nazis, initiating that training on Hitler's birthday. We, we have the repeated, I assume was not the U.S. idea, but theirs, uh, the, the repeated endless lies and propaganda of unproven claims of Russian aggression and invasion and shooting down airplanes and so forth uh, over the past months aimed at instigating violence. You have, you have widespread concern, including in the German parliament, as I mentioned earlier, but, but big public demonstrations in, in Prague, in Kiev, uh, against uh, what is seen as U.S. aggression toward Russia. Uh, and you have more weapons and more tanks and more troops uh, and more pressure for expanding NATO membership into these countries all the time, pressuring the border of Russia. You have Iran urging China and India and other countries to join Russia in opposing NATO expansionism. Uh, I mean, this is what much of the world sees that the U.S. media doesn't see. Uh, and you have a, a nuclear non-proliferation treaty that the United States, like Russia, blatantly violates. Is put, the United States government is putting huge new money in developing new nukes uh, and is failing to dismantle its nuclear uh, weaponry as required by that treaty. And you have a serious uh, growing movement uh, around the world backed by numerous nations uh, and being added new nations every day now uh, to, to try a better treaty that actually abolishes all nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's something that we ought to be, we ought to be getting behind. But it, it, I, think, I think the danger is escalated by the fact that nobody in the nation that is really instigating it knows anything about it. That's a great point, David. Everything you say is absolutely perfect about what the U.S. has done instigating the coup. You have the point now it's gotten so absurd that the NATO Secretary General is condemning Russia for military exercises within Russia. Mm -hmm. Why, meanwhile, on the same week that the U.S. 173rd Airborne lands in Ukraine, 
to start training Ukrainian, not the Ukrainian military, but the Ukrainian Volunteer National Guard, which, as you point out, you know, contains some very unsavory elements. You also have the UK there, Canada there, training these people. The Russian military has said that uh, these trainers have also been seen in eastern Ukraine, which would be a blatant violation of the Minsk II Accords, where foreign forces are not allowed to be there. We've seen over and over again US, the US ambassador in Kiev claiming that Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia invaded Ukraine. 10,000 Russian troops with all the equipment that goes with them have invaded, yet there's not a single picture of it. Uh, yesterday, the American ambassador, Jeff Pyatt, tweeted a photo of a book site saying, this is, this is in eastern Ukraine. The Russians have just moved it there. Well, it was immediately shown to be something from a 2013 air show in Moscow. So it's, it's, it's absolutely blatant. So I would say, are we moving toward war with Russia, nuclear perhaps? I would say the tripwire has been inserted, the 173rd. What if something happens to one of these guys? If there's all the incentive in the world for this government in Kiev that we put into place that knows that they're about to collapse economically, they have every incentive in the world to put up some sort of a false flag and have some Americans die, and then who's going to sit here in the U.S.? Which of us in this room we'd probably be put away is, is going to argue that, that you can't do anything in retaliation. So I think it's an extraordinarily dangerous situation. And oh, by the way, the accidental use of nuclear weapons is in some ways more frightening. So you're talking about the conscious use of them. And you know, Eric Schlosser's book, I think, details the frightening number of times that um, we came within a hair's breadth of of an accidental nuclear uh, nuclear war, um, places where, if not but for one person deciding to reject the protocol and the order, uh, we wouldn't be here. So, I'm going to throw out one broad question, and then I've got I'm going to hit as many of these as we can. Uh, my question is the one from the uh, title. I'd like you folks, if you would, to comment. What should the United States foreign policy be like? What would be a better foreign policy? What should be our relationship with the rest of the world? Can you start anywhere? Uh, well, let me go real quickly. One is, at the end of World War II, the United States was in an unprecedented position to change the direction of history, and it chose not to. It chose dominance instead of cooperation. It set up the legal structure under which that could have happened, the UN Charter. Uh, and, and so we have to go back and remember the, the sort of the opportunity lost. One way to think about it is to go back and reclaim that promise of that moment. But the other, so that's a very sort of specific thing. The other thing is I don't think any of this can happen if we don't recognize that the United States is the most affluent country in the history of the world, that that affluence is not the result of just hard work. It's the result of a tremendous amount of violence. And that unless there's, a, a, I think, a national conversation about what it means to live at a lower scale, it's hard to imagine that this is going to change significantly. That's a hard conversation to imagine, in part because no politician is ever going to run on a platform of, I guarantee you, that your lifestyle will diminish in terms of energy and material consumption. But I think in addition to all the things we're talking about, there has to be that conversation also uh, about probably one of the, the most age-old of the philosophical questions, which is what does it mean to live a good life? And that's been defined for us by a very pathological economic system that's a very recent development in human history, that is capitalism. And I think we need to open that up as well. I'll go next if anybody doesn't, if anybody else doesn't want to. Uh, I, I think the United States uh, needs not to improve its empire or get rid of the bad part of its empire and keep the good part of its empire. I think the United States needs to treat the rest of the world with respect. Uh, I think the United States needs to become part of the rest of the world, support the International Criminal Court, cease to be the lone or almost lone holdout on things like the, the, the Treaty on the Rights of the Child, on things like the, the Convention on, uh, on, on Social, Economic, and Cultural Rights, on things uh, the, the United States needs to abandon its isolated policy as of the defender of Israeli crimes. Uh, 
the United States needs to treat the rest of the world as worthy of respect and, uh, and treatment under the rule of law rather than with violence, which means ceasing to arm and prop up dictators. Uh, it means treating the world uh, as requiring legal behavior from uh, its governments. And it means in rather than investing a trillion dollars a year in warfare, invest tens, hundreds of billions uh, in useful aid and become very easily, for a much smaller cost, the most loved nation on earth. Imagine giving the world schools and hospitals rather than bombs and occupations. I mean, this was the, uh, this was the proposal of the Nobel, uh, worthy Nobel Peace Prize laureate uh, from Iran, Shirin Ibadi, at the time of 9-11. She said, go and build a school in Afghanistan for, named for each victim of 9-11 so people learn about what 9-11 was uh, and get something good that they, they will appreciate. Uh, of course, the United States took a very different approach from that. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, not, last but not least, the, the, the ships, the planes, the drones, the bases, the troops in almost every country on earth, bring them home. Bring them home and don't send them back. I would uh, mostly endorse what, what you said, David. I would, I would, I would diverge slightly in some areas. I, I certainly obviously support a complete non-interventionist foreign policy, and that, of course, means military intervention as well. But it also means uh, not uh, forcibly exporting uh, certain types of U.S. values, certain types of things that are historically unique to us onto other countries. We, for example, we, we may have to accept that the Islamic Republic of Iran will be an Islamic Republic. We have to accept, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, we have to accept that there will be countries that will adopt different systems that we may not agree with. I think there are a lot of good intentions that go along with foreign aid, but when you look on the ground at how it's implemented, it is often imp implemented in a way that, that hurts the recipients in some way or other. Uh, it picks favorites. Uh, sometimes it comes with it some cultural imperialism. So I think we have to be careful. I think the solution would be for us, and as, as your organization in, in mind does, to voluntarily uh, get involved in, in areas, but I think we have to be careful at, uh, at that interventionist impulse that we want to do something for someone else whether they want it or not. Are you suggesting that because foreign aid tends to be so corrupt and militarized we couldn't, it would be physically impossible for us to give food or doctors or, or uh, useful non-manipulative foreign aid uh, and that doing so as a society wouldn't be far more effective than supposedly doing it voluntarily, which we could be doing now but aren't? I think it would be more effective doing it voluntarily through voluntary organizations. Absolutely. Why? Well, what's, what's stopping them? Well, the same government that you complain about that bombs things, you want to have them engaged in doing things that you like. It doesn't work that way. Oh, very different government. Okay. <clears throat> Colonel, did you want to weigh in on you know, this I'm, question? I was pondering while I was hearing um, what I was hearing, and I was thinking of the example that's before us right now. Uh, I don't care what you what you think about this president. I don't care what you think about the motivations of his staff or the motivations of the people in Iran. But what's happening right now with Iran, though it may be derailed by my party um, and certain Democrats too, is an example of how we can do better in the world, foreign policy and security policy-wise. We are actually talking to an arch enemy to whom we haven't talked since 1979. The heads of state of Iran and the United States have not spoken to each other since 1979 and the fall of the Shah. They are now speaking to each other. President Rouhani is speaking to President Obama. Foreign Minister Zarif is speaking to Secretary of State Kerry. Negotiations are going on. Talk is going on. We are actually on the verge of a win-win agreement between an arch enemy and ourselves over some fairly serious issues. Why can't we deal with the world from that perspective on every issue instead of with bombs, bullets, and bayonets? 
which have proven particularly unproductive and disadvantageous to everyone concerned. It was, was pointed out very eloquently just now. I think that's an example of how the United States could live in the world. And by the way, the, the, the empire of liberty, as Jefferson conceived it, was an empire that by its example, not force, by its example, sought to attract the rest of the world to democracy, to freedom, and so forth. If they didn't want to come there, tough. We weren't going to force them to. I mean, John Quincy Adams probably said it best when he said we had no business going abroad to fight monsters. Were we to do so, we would become a monster. You're right, John. Got a question here, uh, a pretty big question. Does the elimination of war inherently mean the elimination of nationalism? <laughs> We had, we, we had a, I'll, I'll jump right in again. We had a project up at MIT about a year ago. I, it, I say we. John Tierman and Malcolm Byrne from George Washington University have had this project for some time. Uh, this particular episode in it was Iran and the United States. And what John and Malcolm did was bring academics to the table who were expert in Iran and the United States, and particularly in relations between the two over time, and people from Iran and people from the United States who had actually been in the governments of those two countries and who had hated each other working for the past 25 or 30 years and even before when we worked with Iran as a, as a partner when the Shah was there. And it was marvelous to watch what happened in that room and I'm sure that Malcolm and John intended that to happen. It was a, what they called later in a sort of hot wash up afterwards brief the building of empathy, the putting one side in the other side's shoes and vice versa, and beginning to understand the other side's perspective. And it was marvelous to watch over just two days, people were, who were uh, you know, high-level U.S. diplomats, high-level Iranian diplomats, academics who knew a little bit about the history of both, actually come to some understandings of what the other side felt and let those understandings inform then what they felt. At the end of that 48 hours or so, there was a whole different attitude in that room about what was possible, about what was achievable, only, in my view, because we had built empathy in one another. Um, I think that's a very important principle. I think it's at the bottom of, it's fundamental to diplomacy. It's certainly not fundamental to military operations at all. And diplomacy is the way you do this. And that's the reason I come back to what's happening today and say there's a wonderful example today in our face of what could happen, what the potential is for dealing with the world rather than intervening, bombing, or whatever. I agree, and I, I think to answer the, the question, the United States is unique in its war making. I mean, the other 95.5% of humanity is represented by governments that invest radically less in war making. Uh, and many of them have what you would call nationalism. Um, but nationalism can mean a lot of different things. Uh, I mean, you can live in a country and like the country and like the country's songs and flags, but actually care what the rest of the world thinks of your country and want to learn good ideas and tools from other countries uh, and be interested in learning other languages and appreciative of the world and opposed to militarism. Uh, and whether that's nationalism or not, I don't know. But U.S. nationalism, which thinks of the rest of the world as inferior, of no interest, with nothing to teach us, uh, which treats wars as sporting events and cheers for the U.S. side, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, there, is, there, is, there are very few things culturally that we could do to scale back the militarism than to critique and outgrow the nationalism. You know, uh, I mean, I will sit uh, and watch a sports game and cheer for one team, but when they score, I won't say, hey, we scored. Well, I sat on my butt and drank a beer. I didn't score anything. 
Uh, and, and when you think that way about the U.S. military, and you say, well, we had to bomb that village to save it because we had been told this and that, and, and you put yourself in the shoe. I mean, to, uh, to look at a picture of a protest at Fort Benning and say, here's a protest of a place where we torture, where, where you train torturers. No, we do the protesting. The government that we are trying to get under our control that is refusing to be governed by us uh, it does the training of the torturers. Uh, if we can sort of identify with humanity rather than with a particular four or five percent of humanity, uh, it, will, it will radically improve our ability to get away from war. So I, I don't think it's a law of physics. You have to end one to end the other, uh, but I think it would be of help to end the sort of nationalism that is that is much too common uh, in the United States. Um, and and there's, there's absolutely no excuse for it, justification for it. We should not be having little kids in schools like little fascist robots pledging allegiance to a bloody piece of cloth and, and, and you know, with the, the salute, you know, used to be this, they changed it to this, doesn't make it less fascistic. We, we, should not be, we should not be celebrating militarism and nationalistic songs and, uh, and marching bands at sporting events or anywhere else. I mean, we should get rid of that stuff. Uh, and we should be celebrating humanity and the world. And, and so when we hear about a drone victim who happens to be American, as opposed to the thousands of drone victims that don't, our response should be exactly the same. One of us got killed. One of us, our human species, got killed. That's how we should instinctively think. Uh, and whenever we say we, we should mean we humanity, or in certain cases, we Texans or we in this club. But, but to, to use we to refer to a criminal enterprise uh, uh, that we actually are protesting, um, I, I think it twists our, our thinking in the wrong way really quickly, one of the, my most hated uh, bumper stickers in the peace movement is peace is patriotic. I've been arguing against that one for a long, long time because uh, I'm not patriotic, to echo um, a question that was uh, asked earlier. I don't believe in patriotism. I think nation states are fundamentally untenable ways to organize politically. Uh, I have a commitment to a set of principles that I want to universalize about the inherent dignity of all people. I have real life commitments to certain people and places. I come from North Dakota. I love the prairie. There are certain things that have shaped me as a human being, like every other human being in the history of the species has been shaped by connections to lived experience. But so I'm, I'm big on those real world commitments and connections to people. I'm big on universal principles. I'm against almost everything in between, and the nation state is one of those things in between. So. I don't only I don't want to say listen I'm just as patriotic as someone who supports the war I want to say patriotism is a, is a, a dysfunctional way to think about the world and whether or not we want nation states and nationalism around it's it's not going to be around forever because the ecological realities are such I think that we're going to have to start thinking about other ways to organize ourselves politically bioregionalism watersheds all these kind of ideas and that reminds us that we have two tasks. One is to try and affect policy in the short term, because in the short term, people suffer as a result of that policy. But at the same time, if we're not imagining new ways of living, I think we're failing. And often it's not clear what's most important at any given moment or how to integrate these two tasks. But that's one of the things that your question brought up, that, that often we're pulled between these two really both very important kinds of uh, obligations we have. Daniel, you may want to jump in. I just want to say we're about to the five-minute point. Uh, so I think, I think we've covered the nationalism let, aspect. Uh, let me put two questions together, and this will probably wrap it up. And with great questions here. I wish we had another hour. We're going to have to get together and spend some more hours and talk about these issues. We can't do it all in one day. We're planning these days. They're coming up. They're in your schedule at the end of the program. We're starting three weeks from today. Um, here are two questions that I thought might be good for you folks to comment on. Uh, how can we transition to a world without war? What practical steps can be taken? And that can be taken toward a, the better foreign policy, whatever you think it should be. 
And the other, another way to ask that question, especially in light of this left right day and, and you folks up here, what are the challenges and opportunities of the left and right working together to stop all U.S. wars? So what can we do, in other words, and how can the left and right work together? What do we need to do? I'll take the first one and then shut up. I think that the problem is the problem of hierarchy. The problem is the naturalizing of hierarchy. And I, there are lots of different ways that happens in the world today. It happens around racial dynamics and gender dynamics. It happens around uh, economics and capitalism. It happens around war and foreign policy. It happens most foundationally, perhaps, in the human belief in our natural place over the rest of the, the living world. And my point of view is everybody has different talents and temperaments. And wherever one is working on whatever one of those hierarchies is most compelling to you,